Um, so welcome. Thank you very much for coming. It's fantastic to see so many people here. I did think uh, it was possible that just Julian and I uh, yet again would be, uh, would be debating this, this case that we've been uh, debating uh, slightly, in a slightly circular fashion for, for now uh, uh, quite a long time. Um, so just uh, preliminaries. Um, so uh, neither Julian nor I have any conflicts of interest. Um, the information that we'll talk about in relation to this particular case, which, as I think everyone here is aware of, is the Charlie Gard case, um, uh, but we may mention some of the others with similar features. Uh, we only have access to information in the case in the public domain, so we won't refer to any uh, confidential medical details. Uh, we might also uh, be interested in, uh, in uh, flogging our book, so it, just in case anybody is interested at the end of this, uh, I have a couple of copies that I, I'm able to sell at a the discounted price of £25 uh, at the end of proceedings. So if you'd like to, um, uh, you can grab a copy then. But if you aren't prepared uh, uh, with uh, cash to, to buy a copy, but you're still interested, the various flyers on the end of the rows uh, or at the back have got a discount code and you can order it online. So, uh, so the case. The case which uh, I suspect everyone here will be aware of, unless you were possibly... Uh, up Mount Everest or in a cave uh, um, uh, or somewhere in outback Siberia um, at the time uh, that started our own kind of intellectual journey uh, was the case of Charlie Gard. So just to reprise it for those who might, might have missed it or have forgotten, Charlie Gard was born in August 2016, so just over two years ago. Uh, and he was an otherwise well, healthy baby, uh, to all intents and purposes, normal scans, born in good condition, went home with his parents from hospital. Um, but within the first weeks, uh, first two months of life, uh, things were not quite, quite right for him at home. Uh, he wasn't gaining weight, he wasn't feeding properly, he seemed weaker than other babies. Um, and his parents uh, took him to hospital uh, at about six to eight weeks of age. And in fact, by the time that he, he was taken to hospital, uh, it was apparent actually that he was very seriously ill and he ended up very quickly on life support at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Uh, and at that point in time, the doctors uh, on, on doing further tests in Charlie found evidence that he had problems affecting his muscles. They seemed to be extremely weak. He was, uh, he was very floppy. Uh, that affected his breathing, so he was on a ventilator. You can see the, the tube in his nose to help him breathe. Uh, he had abnormal abnormally high blood lactate levels, he had abnormalities in his heart and his kidneys, a combination of features that to doctors was highly suggestive of an, uh, of an inborn, fairly fundamental error, uh, abnormality in his metabolism, uh, a mitochondrial defect. And indeed, the, the further tests that he had in the coming month or two, uh, a biopsy of his muscles and a, a, a sequencing of his genome revealed that he did indeed have a very rare uh, but very grave condition affecting his mitochondria. So the mitochondria, for those who aren't medically uh, based, are like the, the energy source, they're the, the batteries of our cells. We have billions of mitochondria in our body. They contain DNA, uh, and there are some very rare biochemical defects in uh, the synthesis of DNA within our mitochondria. So we make new mitochondria all the time, to do that, you have to recycle the DNA that's in your mitochondria or, or make new mitochondria. And, and problems in that process lead to one of these uh, very rare conditions called mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome, uh, of which there, there are two serious forms that affect babies, uh, both of which are extremely rare. There's a, a form that mostly affects muscle, causes babies to be very, very weak. It's called TK2 and an even rarer form that affects both muscle and brain, the form that affected Charlie Gard, called RRM2B. Uh, there were six children in the world who'd been previously described to have the form of, of illness that Charlie Gard had been diagnosed with. All of those infants had died in infancy. And the doctors, on discovering that, D that Charlie Gard had this rare uh, disorder, mitochondrial DNA depletion, and then finding that he had this even rarer uh, and 
what looked to be uniformly uh, lethal condition had told his parents that actually the best thing to do would be to stop the life support that was keeping him alive uh, uh, and accept that it was time to let him die. But Charlie's parents, like many parents in this situation, I'd work in intensive care and I'd look after very sick babies, um, struggled to accept this. Like many parents in the current era, they sought other information and they do what other parents do, is that they Google. And the first thing that they found on Googling treatment for mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome was a therapy called nucleoside treatment. Uh, they saw this article, uh, or something like it, uh, that described uh, a young child with the related form, but slightly less severe form, TK2. Uh, this boy is called Arturito Stopanen. And in the, in the US, several years earlier, his parents, having also been told that their child had an incurable, very severe disorder, um, had sought out a doctor in New York who had been trying a treatment in mice to supplement the nucleosides that uh, weren't being uh, that weren't being made to, to make his mitochondrial DNA. And in Arturito's con case, uh, th this supplementation uh, had led to some improvement. Uh, several years later, as you can see, in 2015, and indeed uh, in 2018, he's still alive. Uh, he was home. He was still on a breathing machine to keep him alive. He was still profoundly weak, but he was uh, certainly surviving longer than the doctors had expected. And Charlie Gard's parents had felt uh, that this treatment should be tried in their son. However, uh, after further discussion with the doctors at Great Ormond Street, there was concern that this treatment, which had worked in the other form of mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome, wouldn't help Charlie. And, and the reason for that, part of the reason, was that in Charlie's case, it seemed to be affecting his brain as well as his muscles. The doctors uh, had felt that he had evidence of brain damage with very abnormal electrical activity in his brain. Uh, and they had come to the conclusion that this treatment had no chance or next to no chance of helping him. So at the beginning of 2017, end of 2016, the parents of this very sick child and the doctors uh, had reached a point of uh, what seemed like irreconcilable disagreement. The doctors had started moving towards a court to resolve this disagreement. The parents had started moving towards uh, uh, public funding a crowdfunding for treatment. So at the beginning of February, the parents launched a, an online appeal for funding to take Charlie overseas, and the doctors had uh, launched a court action. They'd approached the High Court. At the beginning of April 2017, the Family Division of the High Court in this country heard the medical evidence, both from the experts in this country and the experts in the States, who had said that he thought it was unlikely this treatment would work, but that he would be prepared to provide it for Charlie. Um, uh, and the judge concluded that it was not in Charlie's best interests to provide the treatment. So that's the, the background, the, the central disagreement between the family and the, and the clinicians at the heart of the story. That's the story that many of you will have read in the papers. But there's another sort of disagreement that occurred in, the, in, uh, in this case. So, so uh, professionals like myself, uh, an ethicist and a health professional, my colleague Julian Savalescu, also found ourselves at disagreement. Julian and I have worked together for a long time uh, in medical ethics. We find lots of areas where we have similar views. But on this case, we found ourselves at odds. Uh, uh, and we wrote opposing editorials in one of the medical journals, The Lancet, uh, Julian arguing... Uh, in favour of treatment, he argued that the, the court decision was incorrect. And myself arguing in defence of the court decision and the, the doctor's conclusions about treatment for Charlie Gard. Uh, over the coming series of months, as you'll recall, there were a series of legal appeals. There was a, a court of appeal decision uh, in May. We again wrote about uh, where we agreed and where we disagreed in relation to the Gard case. Uh, when the case was heard in the Supreme Court, uh, Char uh, Julian argued that, uh, that uh, Charlie should have been given the chance of experimental treatment. 
Uh, and I argued in, in opposition that uh, experimental treatment was sometimes wrong to give, even though uh, there might be some small chance of it benefiting a child because of the potential harms of that treatment. Uh, in July, uh, when the European Court of Human Rights was considering Charlie's case, um, uh, Julian and I reflected again in opposite directions about what the case meant uh, for the law, uh, for justice, and whether, whether we should in fact be afraid of the implications uh, of the, the Charlie Guard judgment. At the conclusion of the case, as, as many of you will know, uh, the legal appeals were unsuccessful and Charlie Gard died uh, in July 2017. We tried to come together uh, to find areas of agreement, to try and find some lessons from a case that had been extremely painful uh, and from the outside very obviously damaging to both the family and the health professionals uh, and potentially the infant right at the heart of, of this case. So that started our, our own reflections on the, the guard case and on the issues raised by disagreement between health professionals and patients about medical treatment. Uh, and it led, led ultimately to the book uh, that we're launching today. What I'm going to do, what we're going to do in the course, over the course of the next uh, three quarters of an hour or so is to, to pray see some of the, the different areas of disagreement. So we're going to, going to point to two different types of question that occur in these cases. Cases about medical treatment, should it be provided or not? We're going to point to two different reasons, ethical reasons why treatment maybe shouldn't be provided, maybe it should. We're going to point to areas of disagreement between us uh, where the concern is that treatment would be harmful for the child. We'll also uh, point to separate disagreement about how we should allocate resources. In both these areas, these are the two central areas that, that uh, are at stake in these cases, there is potential for reasonable disagreement uh, and we'll point to different ways that we should potentially resolve these disagreement in these two different areas. Uh, and we'll, we'll point to, if there's time, some practical suggestions for how uh, future cases should be resolved as um, again, many in this room will be aware the Charlie Guard case was certainly not the last case of these disagreements. In fact, there have been two very high-profile cases uh, since then, in, in, the, in the last uh, six or eight months, uh, where, again, disagreements been between parents and, and clinicians have, have ended up in the courts. So these two questions, as I, I've already highlighted, um, raised by situations where health professionals feel that that treatment shouldn't be provided. They might use the language of futility. Futility is a, is a term that doctors use to refer to treatment that they think shouldn't work, uh, shouldn't be provided because it won't work. Um, uh, but futility has become an F word in medical ethics for a variety of reasons, largely because uh, it's very difficult to pin down what exactly do people mean by futility. So sometimes they'll use all, all sorts of other words instead that treatment's not clinically indicated or not medically inappropriate. But fundamentally there are two ethical reasons to not provide treatment. One would be if the treatment would be harmful to the patient. The other is if the treatment would be harmful to other patients, particularly if it would uh, thereby mean that other, pe other patients would be denied limited resources. And those two questions we suggest we need to separate because our strategies for resolving them should be different. So thinking about the first, ethical questions around the medical care of children focus particularly on questions about whether treatment is in the best interests of the child. So the courts, medical guidelines say that doctors should be focused on whether treatment's in the child's best interests. One of the curious things about this approach is that it seems to move the, the position of, of families in these decisions to almost nothing. After all, if treatment's in the best interest of the child, then what's parents' views got to do with it, or vice versa? In practice, the, the model, the, the framework that these decisions about medical treatment for children actually works in is, is that there are situations where treatment's certainly in the interest of a child, there are situations where it's definitely not in the interest of the child. And in between, 
is an area where parents and doctors together discuss whether or not to provide treatment. Uh, and parents' decisions are usually crucial in determining whether treatment proceeds. But there's an, a boundary to this grey zone or pink zone in my diagram. And those boundaries are set by what's sometimes referred to as a harm threshold. So the idea is that when treatment would be harmful to a child, it shouldn't be provided. If withholding treatment would be harmful to the child, the example of, for example, a, a, a child uh, whose desperately anemic parents are refusing a blood transfusion, if withholding the treatment would be harmful, treatment should, be should, should certainly be provided. But of course that raises the question, the question that, that rose to the fore in the guard case, is what is being requested by the family actually harmful? And on that there can be different views. Is it a harm? So I'm going to get you guys to think about this. Um, when, we, when we were trying to concentrate on uh, the ethical issues at the heart of, of the guard case, uh, one of the things that we, we do in practical ethics is sometimes uh, focus on, on thought experiments. So I want you to, to focus on this, and if you've managed to connect your device to this uh, website, then, then you get to uh, answer the following the question in a second. If you haven't, you can, you can enter it in while, while I'm describing it. So imagine a child uh, today or tomorrow in, in the hospital has a very, been diagnosed with a very severe illness. It's an illness that's almost universally fatal. The child's sedated in intensive care but is potentially aware or in pain some of the time. And the doctors have come to a conclusion that if treatment is continued, if the child is kept alive on life support for three months, there's a one in a thousand chance that they would recover. Of course, there's a 999 out of a thousand chance that they will not recover and will still die. If we set aside any question about limited resources, the costs of treatment, limited beds in intensive care, the question, and this is an abstracted version of the question at the heart of the guard case, is would it be a harm to the child in the face of this very low chance to continue intensive care for three months? So here you go, here, here you get to, to have a, a vote. Uh, for those who, who don't have a, a device or aren't connected to the internet, you can just indicate with a hand in a second. Uh, do you think that it would be in the child's best interest in the face of this very small chance to provide treatment uh, for three months? Do you think it wouldn't be in the child's best interest, but it wouldn't definitely be harmful? Or do you think uh, that it wouldn't be in the child's best interest and in fact it would be a harm to keep this child alive on life support for three months given the low chance of, survi of survival? Uh, and survival in this case is survival to a quality of life that the child and their parents would regard as worth living. Okay, so if, uh, if you are able to connect and, uh, and answer this question, we'll, we'll see how many people have managed to, to do this in a second. No, I didn't give the age of the child. Uh, it's an interesting question whether, whether that we might think that that's, that's relevant or not. Um, I can stipulate an age if, if you like. Uh, we can stipulate that the child is uh, four months old. It changed your vote. <laughs> okay, so let's see what, what have you said. So, so a third of you, uh, or slightly less than a third, nine of you have said it would be in the child's best interests. Some of you, uh, another nine have said that it wouldn't be in the child's best interest but not harmful. Uh, and uh, slightly less than half, 14 have said uh, that it, it would be a harm to provide treatment for the child. It would not be in the child's best interest. Interesting. Okay, so we've got division and disagreement amongst the audience. Uh, Julian and I were in, in Melbourne fairly recently and asked a, a, a large group of about 150 uh, health professionals at the Children's Hospital in Melbourne um, you guys uh, are, are, are giving answers very similar to the, the doctors and nurses that, at the Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Again, a quarter thought it was in Charlie, it, a kind of hypothetical version of Charlie's case uh, in the child's best interest. A third, maybe, uh, but not harmful, and, uh, and uh, slightly more than a third, uh, it would be harmful. Okay, so 
At this point, Julian and I are going to, to, to cross swords. Oh, no, we've got one, more, got one more thing before we do that. Um, so I've got, I've got another, another question for you guys to answer. So I've got a slightly different version of the, this situation that I want you to think about. Uh, so I have some bad news for you. As you walk out of the Martin School this evening, uh, one of the crazy cyclists whizzing past on the road is going to collide with you uh, in a very bad way. Unfortunately, you're going to end up in hospital this evening and you're almost certain to die. Uh, so, in fact, uh, there's, uh, uh, the doctors have come to a conclusion very rapidly uh, that there's a, only a one in a thousand chance that you will survive. Like in the case that I just imagined, uh, if intensive care is, is continued for three months, uh, a period of time that you'll potentially be aware and un in uncomfortable and in pain some of the time, uh, you will, uh, if, if intensive care is continued for three months, um, uh, there's a one in a thousand chance that you'll survive, but a 999 in a thousand chance that you will die. But I have, a, I have an option, a, a choice for you. You can choose at this point in time whether to take a red pill. And the red pill is that this evening the doctors will call your family around and stop life support. Uh -huh. Or the blue pill is that the doctors will continue life support for the next three months uh, with that one in a thousand chance that you'll survive. So I want you to think this time, not abstractly about some child, I want you to think about yourself. What would you take? Would you take the red pill or the blue pill? The red pill, you'll die today. Blue pill, uh, you will uh, uh, have a one in a thousand chance of recovery after three months of intensive care to a quality of life that you would regard as acceptable. There was a, is that the question? Yeah. So, are you going to choose the red pill or the blue pill? Uh, for those who, who, who haven't got uh, internet enabled devices, perhaps you can indicate uh, any votes for red pill? I can see uh, four hands for a red pill. Uh, uh, five. Any votes for the blue pill? There's a few votes for the blue pill. Should we see what... Uh, oh, hang on. Should we see what you've said? So, those who have got... have managed to do it online, 11 of you have said chosen the red pill. 24 have chosen the blue pill. So, many of you are inclined, as I would, to think this is a bad gamble. Uh, but some of you perhaps inclined as Julian would to take the chance. So we, so we're, and again, a, a fairly similar division, slightly more in favour of the red pill when we asked this question in Melbourne. So Julian, why do you think that it wouldn't be a, a harm to provide treatment in, in a case like this? Um, well, I mean, as both of these little surveys showed, is that there's division about whether um, some pain over three months uh, is worth a one in a thousand chance. There's no objective fact about the answer to that question. I mean, in the case of Charlie Gard, I think you can even subtract away the pain because he could have been given heavy analgesia and sedation and at the end uh, of his life, Great Ormond Street still weren't sure whether he was in pain or not and only then decided to start low dose uh, morphine. But even assuming there was some pain associated with it, um, it's really unclear uh, what the answer to that gamble is. And in, in my view, um, in this case, you ought to defer to individuals like me. I would want the three months and the one in a thousand chance. So we should certainly treat adults according to their wishes. And when it comes to children, if there's uncertainty, as there clearly is here, we should defer to the wishes of the parents. Uh, it's not because the parents are right, it's because we're in that grey zone. So I think we were in that zone of parental discretion. Dominic thinks we were outside of it. But I defer anyone, here. I, I defy anyone here to give me an argument definitively for how um, three months of intermittent mild pain outweighs a one in a thousand chance uh, of recovery to an acceptable quality of life. Certainly that didn't happen in the court. It was the 
doctor's intuitions and the judge's intuitions, um, and absent some compelling argument, I think we should have deferred to the wishes of the parents or the individuals. Very good. So that's Julian's view. So my own view, as, as somebody who works in intensive care, um, differs from Julian in two respects. So one is uh, that I am concerned about the pain and discomfort that the children in intensive care connected to life support experience. We attempt, we work hard uh, to provide a variety of different measures to keep children comfortable when they're sick and on life support and intensive care, but those measures are flawed and imperfect uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but the children who are on life support for a long period of time, in my experience, seem to have periods where they are uncomfortable, they arise from, from sedation, uh, uh, and, and uh, appear to be in pain or discomfort. So, so I, I'm, I have more concern about the, the pain or, and discomfort than, than uh, Julian has. Partly, I, I acknowledge, because of the experience that I have of those children in intensive care. The second reason why I differ from Julian is that in the face of these very low chances of survival, my perspective as a health professional is slightly different. So when I think about cases like the guard case, I think about the many cases where uh, parents have asked me or where parents ask other health professionals to provide treatment that has a very low chance of helping the child, uh, but some significant chance of harming the child. In the, in the hypothetical example, one in a thousand chance that the child will improve to a quality of life that's acceptable, 999 out of 1,000 that the child will thereby die. If I had 1,000 children in that situation, it means that 999 of them would have unpleasant, at least some of the time, treatment um, for no benefit, and one of those children would be the, the lucky child for whom the gamble is worthwhile. Now, I think for each of us, as adults, we can decide whether we want to take that gamble. But, of course, the child themselves can't decide. Uh, and so we have to, as professionals, try and draw some line about when that gamble is too risky, when the harm is too great. Uh, and for me, reflecting on, the, on this case and these, these statistics, the harm seemed to be too great, the chance seemed to be too low uh, to engage in this gamble. But we disagree. Uh, and Julian is, is, as a health professional, somebody and somebody who's thought about the philosophy and ethics of these cases, somebody who I have an enormous amount of respect for. So the question then is, what do we do when there's disagreement between people who, who should know what, what's, at, what's at stake here, what to do? Well, there are a variety of different reasons why there's disagreement in these cases. Uh, there are dis there's challenges in assessing suffering or harm. The children themselves can't tell us. We can only guess from the outside how much they might be uh, in uncomfortable. There's uncertainty about the future. These numbers that I've given you, the one in a thousand number, we've made it up. There's no way of, of quantifying just what the chances might be. The chances for Charlie Guard were probably very small, but who could put a number on that? And then, of course, there's this ethical problem. How do we weigh up these small chances against those harms? Uh, and fundamentally, there's a very difficult philosophical challenge of working out uh, when a life is worth living, a very controversial question on which uh, there is, in no society is there any uh, agreement about what level that would be. So what do we do in the face of this disagreement? Well, one of the questions that we asked is actually whether we need to all agree. In, in a different context, some years ago, Julian and I and Bob Truk, who's a paediatric intensivist in the States, uh, had suggested that thinking about ethically controversial decisions, life and death decisions, that it was a mistake to think that we all, all the professionals needed to agree. As we've just seen, people in this room are divided. And we shouldn't necessarily think that that's a problem. It's a sign of the, the complexity of these decisions. We shouldn't aspire to everybody agreeing because we're different people. We come from different places. We have different ways of evaluating these decisions. And actually, disagreement might help point us to a way forward. What we've argued in that context, and in this context too, is that if there's reasonable disagreement 
about whether or not treatment should be provided. In fact, as Julian pointed to, if, the, if there is reasonable disagreement about whether or not treatment would be harmful for a child like Charlie Gard, and that and this issue of best interests or harm is the, 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 the central issue, then potentially treatment should be provided. In the book, uh, uh, and I won't have time to go into it in great detail, we set out, well, what do we mean by reasonable disagreement? Because not all disagreement is reasonable. All, all sorts of recent political examples uh, point out that uh, there can be disagreement that is distinctly unreasonable. Uh, but we point to a few things. So one is uh, that somebody who's disagreeing must be able to articulate the reasons for their view. Somebody who says, I just think X, uh, doesn't necessarily uh, seem to be expressing a, a reasonable point of view. Secondly, disagreement needs to be reason sensitive. So if somebody says, I believe X and X will always hold, or you get the impression that it doesn't matter what evidence you present, they will always support X, which is continued treatment or withdrawal of treatment. Again, that suggests that their disagreement is not reasonable. Thirdly, the reasons that they articulate in support of their view need to be uh, acceptable reasons. And, and we describe uh, the ethical f context within the, which these decisions occur in the UK. So, for example, some people in the Guard case expressed the view that treatment should be provided because parents' wishes should be always respected when it comes to, to life and death decisions for children. It's a very understandable sentiment that, that parents should be the final decision makers. However, when we step back and reflect on it, when we think about other cases like the case of, a, of parents refusing a blood transfusion for a child, actually that, that doesn't make any sense. There are situations where parents should be overruled. I, I pointed to this notion that there should be a harm threshold uh, in decisions. So if somebody articulates a view that parents should be the ultimate decision makers, that's their reason for supporting treatment. That wouldn't count as a reason in favour of, of, uh, of their view being, uh, of there being reasonable disagreement. So, so when should be, parents be overruled? If we're focused on this question of harm, we've argued in the book that if there's reasonable disagreement, we should err in favour of providing the treatment as long as it meets these various criteria for reasonable disagreement and there are professionals willing to provide the treatment. It's erring on the side of treatment. It's, it's compatible with our overall approach to these life and death decisions, which is in favour of, uh, of preserving life where there's a possibility that treatment would be a benefit. Can I say something on this? Yeah. So just before we go to half class. So um, my own personal view, so my own, if it were my child, my own life, my line of a life worth living is very high. So I would want my child to be able to live independently, have a job, be able to have meaningful social relationships with, probably go to university. That's the line I draw for life with. It's very high. And I recognise that people don't have that line. And in fact, the Guard family don't have that line. And in fact, the courts don't have that line. The line that's commonly drawn in society is, is a life just where the balance of positive experiences outweigh the balance of negative experiences. And in fact, it's very difficult in the public domain to even refer to any level of disability as making life not worth living. So although I personally hold this very high standard, you know, I can recognise that a much lower standard is reasonable. And in fact, the guard standard, what they were aiming, they knew Charlie would never be going to university, no matter how successful nuclear site replacement therapy was. And their view is reasonable. So in the face of that, I think that even though I personally wouldn't continue treatment if I were in that situation, that was my child, and I don't think that he would have a life that's worth living, their, their view of, of a life worth living is very reasonable. In fact, it's the common view. And so practical ethics is about getting outside of your own particular view to see whether the views outside are reasonable that could potentially be held. So I think it's very important to, to recognise that there can be these differences. And what they were asking for, Peter Singer, another of my colleagues, when I told him this story, and Peter is notorious for having a book called Infanticide, Should, Should the Baby Live? About performing infanticide 
for babies with severe uh, disabilities at the request of their parents. And I told Peter this, the case of Charlie Yard, and he said, I can't see that that is clearly a life that's going to be not worth living because all he needs is to have a balance of positive experiences over negative experiences. So, you know, even people like Peter Singh could see that view is reasonable. So it's not that we would endorse it for ourselves, but whether it's, and one of the challenges of this case is with value pluralism. We're not all going to agree. We're not all going to come to a consensus. And it's about which differences should we tolerate and which differences shouldn't we tolerate. So that's the central idea of the book, trying to arrive not at consensus, but at reasonable disagreement or dissensus, as Dominic said. So, so in, this con in the context of, of decisions that are focused on this question solely of the child and whether it would be harmful, as Julian points out, we, uh, what we need to do is to, to ad admit that there are different ways of thinking about these harms and benefits and that we, we need to respect reasonable disagreement if disagreement is genuinely reasonable. But I pointed out earlier that there's a second reason, a second reason for potentially not providing treatment, and that's the, the concern about harm to other patients, the concern about limited resources within uh, a public health system. Uh, and that drives us in a different direction, a different, less pluralistic direction. Whenever we talk about, whenever people talk about the cost of medical treatment, the idea that maybe treatment should be rationed or limited, uh, particularly life-saving treatment for a, a very sick child, people will say, you can't put a price on life. But the simple uh, reality that we face in a health system, as we're all aware, that is finite in the resources that it has available, is that providing highly expensive treatment for one or some patients means that the health system is able to treat fewer patients. A highly expensive life-saving treatment for one patient means that other patients are not able to access treatment. In, the, in our health system, but also in other health systems, there are ways to look at new treatments or existing treatments, thinking about both the cost of those treatments and their effectiveness. Uh, different countries set the bar at different levels, but we're all aware that medical treatments in our country are not provided sometimes because those treatments are too expensive relative to their benefit. If we're thinking about where we draw that line, when we should provide treatment in the setting of, a, of life and death decisions for a child, we can again get to very difficult uh, areas of disagreement. So here's another example that I'm going to get you folks to think about, uh, a difficult case that, uh, that I've reflected on often. So uh, it, it's referred to as the ECMO case. ECMO is, is a form of life support, very intensive life support, for children who are uh, extremely unwell. They're uh, on, already on breathing machines, and either their lungs are so sick that our breathing machines cannot keep them alive, or their heart is so sick that it cannot keep pumping blood around their body. And they can go onto a heart-lung bypass machine for a period of time to keep them alive. But I want you to imagine, in a case like this, and this is not an unrealistic case, it's a case I've certainly faced, uh, that in a particular instance that the child has other health conditions, perhaps has a genetic disorder, and the the centre that provides treatment for this child is having to decide whether or not to provide this treatment. These same ethical questions about how, who do you provide treatment for also apply to provision of scarce organs for transplantation or scarce intensive care beds. Now there, there might be different ways that an underlying illness or a genetic disability might affect a child. They might affect the length of time that a child needs to stay in intensive care requiring treatment. It might affect the chance that they survive. It might affect the length of time, the months or years that they would survive if treatment is successful in the short time, or it might affect their quality of life. Now, when we start to drill down to these questions, we again have areas that are very difficult and very controversial. Partly because there are two difficult 
there are two competing values at stake when we're thinking about allocating scarce resources like organs for transplantation or treatments like ECMO. They are a desire to secure the greatest good for the greatest number, the, uh, the utilitarian desire to secure the greatest benefit from the limited resources, and a desire to, to treat individuals fairly. And those two different priorities will sometimes lead us in different directions. So here's the question that I want you to, uh, to grapple with. In, in, uh, in my experience, as is, is often the case, when we speak with the centres that provide this very specialised treatment, uh, they have to think very carefully about whether or not to provide treatment. So I want you to imagine that the centre providing ECMO actually has two patients who are in need of treatment. The, these these centres are, are based in, in, one or, in a, a small number of places across the country, uh, uh, and, and so I want you to imagine that one of these centres has, has had two simultaneous requests for treatment. Two children have a severe illness that will be fatal without this uh, very intensive form of life support. There's only a single team that could go and retrieve these children, without which uh, it's almost certain that the child will die. Uh, or uh, if you... Uh, 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 determine that the, ch the centre should go and retrieve one and then go and attempt to retrieve the other, the chance of survival will be much lower for the child that they attempt to retrieve second. So in one side of the country, on the, in the West, there's a child that, based on the information given, they think has a 30% chance of survival if this treatment is provided. And in the east of the country, uh, there's a child with a 70% chance of survival with intensive care. Without this treatment, both children are likely to die in a similar period of time. So what I want you to reflect on is what, what do you think would be the fair thing to do? Should the, the, the centre send the team to the west, to the child with a lower chance of survival, to the east, to the child with a higher chance of survival, or should they toss a coin? So here's where you get to... Uh, get to, to have your, your say again. They both, need ECMO. they both need this same treatment. Yes, what questions? Would be the of life? So again, we can assume that these children will have the same quality of life if they survive, a, a quality of life that they would regard to be acceptable. Can, can we toss a weighted coin? Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the coins that you have available are just the 50-50 coin, but... Uh, if you, if you really want to toss a weighted coin, uh, you, you can just say toss a coin. To you ask me what they should do or what the fair thing, what the fair thing to do is. So, so imagine that they have a 0% a, a survival chance if they do not have this treatment, and then uh, they have either a 30% chance of survival if they have this treatment, or a 70% chance of survival. So one child has a higher chance of survival. So we'll, we'll have, a, have a look and see what, uh, what people think would be the fair thing to do. So most of you are inclined to think that it would be fair to retrieve the child with a higher chance of survival. Uh, uh, about a third of you are inclined to toss a coin. A small number of you are inclined to, to, to uh, think that it would be fair to try and retrieve the child with a lower chance of survival. So it's interesting. Again, div ethical disagreement. Uh, again, very similar s results to the, the results that uh, we had when, uh, when we polled uh, some of the clinicians in, in Australia. But now here's a different scenario that I want you to think about. The same in all respects, except that the child in the West, they, these children have identical chances of survival, but the child in the West has severe cognitive disability and autism, uh, and the child in the East has pre-existing normal intelligence. So here the difference between the children is not in terms of their chance of survival, it's in terms of their pre-existing illness, which we can assume will be exactly the same subsequently. Um, what would be the fair thing to do in this case, 
Feel free to uh, ask a friend if you're uh, <laughs> struggling. When, when, uh, when we asked this question in Melbourne, there was an intake of breath at the point when we asked this question. People didn't like this question. Same chance of survival, but they differ in their level of uh, pre-existing function and presumed uh, post-treatment function. Uh, again, without treatment, both children will die. And whichever treatment you, child you don't treat will die. So should we see what the, the group think in this case? Oh, we have, oh, I'm sorry. I haven't, oh, there you are. Yep. What would be the fair thing to do? I haven't given you the chance to... You can, now you can vote. So, so, so here there's much more inclination to toss a coin. Um, uh, about a third are inclined to send the, the plane to the east to retrieve the child with normal intelligence, but two thirds are inclined to toss a coin. Can I say one thing about this? So, um, on um, some of the most influential theories of justice, uh, one of them being prioritarianism, uh, which is an egalitarian theory, you should give priority to the worst off. So that says you should retrieve this child. Nobody voted for that. So that shows how, and this was the most dominant form of, of, of theory of justice, John Rawls's theory of justice. Um, no, nobody intuitively thinks that's um, the right answer. So I'm just quite in conflict with, uh, <laughs> with theories of justice. Hey, and again, similar, similar results when we, uh, we asked uh, clinicians in Melbourne. Okay, so Julian, what, so what do you think about this question? So what, the, these, uh, this ethical question of fairness and, and division of resources, decisions on the basis of survival or disability? Well, again, it, it depends on your theory of fairness. So if your chance of survival, so say there's one heart and your chance of surviving is 70% and my chance is 30%, um, it makes no difference to me that your chance is better than mine. Um, this is my only chance of surviving, uh, and, it's, and it's still 30%. So I think respecting people as persons is giving them a, an equal chance, uh, an equal chance to have their best chance uh, of surviving. So I think fairness in the first one, fairness, speaks in favour of tossing a coin. Um, utility, so if you treat 100 people in these two conditions, you'll save 70 lives um, if the prognosis is 70% versus 30 lives. So utility says you should choose the person with the better prognosis. But fairness, I think, um, speaks in favour of giving people an equal chance. Um, I won't talk about the second <laughs> case. Uh, <laughs> Because I think that, uh, well, you could say that fairness, strictly speaking, speaks in favour again of tossing a coin, because fairness is about giving each person respect and their greatest chance of the longest, best quality life for themselves. Um, so I think that in the second case, you know, as in the first, fairness speaks in favour uh, of of tossing a coin. Utility speaks in favour of treating the, the normal child because you'll uh, produce more quality adjusted life years for the use of the single resource. So I think in both cases, care speaks in favour of tossing a coin. So again, I, I agree with Julian in some respects, but disagree with him in others. So I, I have argued uh, that in cases like the first one, where, where we're trying to decide how to allocate resources and some individuals have a lower chance of benefit, that actually it would be fair to, to uh, prioritise those who have a higher chance of benefiting. And one of the reasons for that is that when those decisions are repeated, that we end up with larger numbers of survivors. Now, as Julian says, utility would drive us in favour of, of that decision if we're utilitarians. But I think also fairness, that uh, if, we, if, for example, you had a, a, an example, there's a famous philosophical example of should you send a lifeboat to send uh, in, in one direction to save a single drowning person or five in the other. I have the strong intuition that it would be fair, not simply would generate the greatest benefit, but that it would be fair to, to, to 
send a lifeboat to, to save five individuals rather than the one. And these, these cases of lower chances of survival, if they're repeated, also look as if you end up saving larger numbers of lives. For reasons that I won't go into today, um, some of these questions about uh, quality of life, at least in some cases, we can address it in a similar way. Uh, so there are some, some situations where, although there may be different views about the value of life with uh, very uh, severe degrees of disability, I think there may be some increased uncertainty about whether treatment would be a benefit. And in, in that context, I take a similar view. But we have a situation when we, we're allocating resources where, just as with situations thinking about harm to the patient, where there can be ethical disagreement. And here, again, there are a range of sources of disagreement. What counts as fairness? What do we mean by fair? Uh, there was division within the room about that. How much weight should we give to fairness? So if, we, if we're weighing up fairness against benefit, how much weight should we give to each of these? Quality of life. How should we evaluate? When should we include it? And where, of course, do we set the threshold? So there are, there are, there are very difficult uh, areas, again, on which it's highly unlikely we will ever reach agreement. But when we're thinking about allocating resources, we need a different strategy to the pluralist approach that we took, thinking only about individual patients and giving those patients the benefit of the doubt. Uh, what we argue in the book is that we need a, a, a collective approach to thinking about allocating resources. That could be through policy decisions about which patients you, uh, you provide ECMO for, or it could be a fair process for thinking about individual ch children, thinking about the relevant considerations, and deciding whether the benefit is great enough to provide either continued intensive care, an organ for transplantation, uh, or a treatment like ECMO. In, in the setting of limited resources, parents should be overruled at a different point than when we're thinking about the question of harm, where treat, treatment uh, not will be possibly beneficial to the child, but where will probably harm others. And that potentially gives us a different point. What we point to in the, in the book, and, and for those who are interested, you can read in more detail, uh, is the overall dissentious approach of separating out these different questions, establishing whether there's reasonable dissensus, and applying a fair process for allocation of resources. And uh, in, uh, in another article in The Lancet, uh, Julian and I have set out a schema that we, we uh, spell out in some more detail in the book about how we might try and resolve these uh, disputes, for example, uh, through use of uh, regional national dispute resolution panels that would actually uh, devote attention to the neglected question of resources. If there's agreement that treatment would be reasonable in the child's best interests, it should be provided. If such a panel of, of ethicists, professionals, labor representatives, representatives agreed that treatment wasn't reasonable, it should stop. And where there's disagreement, reasonable disagreement, and an alternative provider who's willing to provide it, uh, that that would potentially support transfer of the child to that other facility. What we've pointed to in this talk are some of the challenges of reaching agreement in the 21st century. And the 21st century is relevant be both because of the complexity of medical information, scientific possibilities, um, the value complexity within our societies. We're not homogenous societies with a single set of values, if we ever were. Um, there are these two separate questions that are raised by these cases, and we need different strategies for dealing with them, and we articulate a starting point, an idea, for how we might uh, to come to, to resolve them. Uh, it's fantastic that you're here. It's great to see the book finally in print. Uh, I think we it's just worth saying one, one thing about the book. So it's really at, at, at several different levels. It's not just about the Charlie Yard case. It's about many cases of conflict. It's about the relevant principles, theories, and concepts that are um, relevant to resolving those um, disagreements. So theories of well-being, concepts of harm, approaches of distributive justice. So it's about the, the toolkit that you could use um, to, to think about those areas of conflict. But the third level is you know, about our journey of 
disagreement and finding out ways of living with disagreement and trying to make progress at the level that you fundamentally disagree with somebody who's equally knowledgeable and who you equally respect. And, and that's this procedure of dissent. So Dominic and I have changed our views about different aspects of the case. I initially thought it wasn't relevant that the, um, that the specialist from the US physically see Charlie Gard. I've now kind of changed my view on that for, for various reasons. And, and I know Dominic's changed his whole view about the case. Um, so no, um, but I, no, I, I'm sure you've uh, changed other aspects of your view. But it, 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 most importantly, it's about how to try to live in the 21st century. Because although it's about Charlie Gard, it could be about any issue of ethical disagreement today. And increasingly, we're living in a world where people have polarised values um, and, and disagree about fun, fundamental matters, that we don't just share a common set of values. We don't just obey authority figures who tell us this is what's in our interests and we, we have access to the internet. Ideas of autonomy uh, are important. We have multiple technological options that don't just do one thing or another. They have probabilities of changing our length and quality of life. It's very, very complicated and we're going to have to create a new ethic, a new way of thinking about ethics to navigate this sort of world. And this is a part of the Welcome Centre's theme, uh, the Welcome Centre for Ethics and the Humanities, and it's what we've tried to do in a small way around these cases in the book. Um, but it will be a part of a long journey for many people um, because these are just going to get more and more difficult. But uh, thank you for coming and uh, buy lots of copies of the book. <laughs> Great Christmas presents. Thanks, Julian.